All right, we are back uh, in a slightly different location, at least momentarily, but as always, I have my copy of The Effect. Uh, and now we're gonna be going into a slightly different way of thinking about causal identification. Uh, you know, in the past, in the past couple chapters we've been going through, been talking about how to identify something by looking at all the alternate explanations for why a relationship might occur, all the alternate pathways uh, between our outcome and our treatment, uh, and then trying to close those down by controlling for stuff. Right. However, there's a problem that is really hard to do. Uh, it's hard to construct the entire causal diagram. Uh, it's hard to make sure that once you construct the entire causal diagram, that other people will also agree with you that that is the proper causal diagram, and therefore you do know the entire set of all the backdoor paths. And even if everybody could agree on what all the proper backdoor paths were, um, how do you make sure that you can actually measure and control for all the things that you need to measure and control for? You might not be able to do that. So, uh, you know, picking the controls is easy enough once you have the diagram, but who knows if the diagram is right, but, and also, can you actually measure everything that you need to measure to control for it? So, uh, we might want to have some other way of trying to identify causal effects other than just being able to control for stuff. Uh, and that brings into the concept of finding front door paths as opposed to closing down back door paths. Because think about what we are trying to do, right? When we are looking at the relationship between the treatment and the outcome, uh, we have multiple paths that we can walk along. We can walk along the front door paths, that are the paths that we want to isolate, and then the back door paths, which are the alternate explanations for why things are related that we want to shut down. So why don't we just pick out the front door paths first without having to find every single back door path and shut it down. And there are ways to do this. And one way that you're probably familiar with is the concept of randomized controlled experiments. If you can randomize your treatment, then you've basically gotten rid of all the back door paths without having to measure anything at all. Because think about what's going on, right? Why is there a back door path? Why is there an alternate route from your treatment to your outcome? Well, because some other factor out there is driving your treatment and also driving your outcome. So in the data, you might see a relationship between those two things that is driven by that alternate factor. But what if you just randomized the treatment? If you randomize the treatment in an experiment, well, then that can't be driving it anymore, right? Uh, if you want to know the effect of whether wearing more shorts makes you eat more ice cream, and you think, well, in the data, temperature is driving both of those things. On a hot day, you're likely to wear more shorts and eat more ice cream. And so if you randomize people to wear shorts or not, well, then suddenly your shorts wearing is no longer determined by the temperature. So it doesn't matter that temperature also makes you eat ice cream because temperature is no longer making you wear shorts, at least in this data. And that's how randomized experiments actually work. They, you pick a set of your data, you randomize the, the treatment in that data, uh, and then you limit yourself to only using the data in which you have randomized things, right? You wouldn't like randomize your treatment and then use the entire set of data. You wouldn't randomize shorts wearing and then include both people in your experiment and out of your experiment. You just focus on the people in your experiment, right? Uh, and well, that's great. So if you could run a randomized experiment, that solves all your backdoor closing paths for you. There are, of course, other problems with experiments that I'm not going to go too deep into in this book uh, or these videos, but that solves that problem for you at least. It at least very easily solves that identification problem for you. Uh, but what if you can't do that? Well, you're not out of luck. There are other ways to isolate front door paths other than being able to actively randomize your treatment. And there are a number of these methods, and we'll cover them in the rest of these videos, but a lot of them center around the general idea that you're looking for some sort of what is called exogenous variation. And exogenous variation is sort of like saying random variation. You're looking for something that is sort of like a randomized experiment, even if it is not literally a randomized experiment. Uh, there needs to be something driving your treatment that is unrelated to your outcome. In other words, there needs to be no back doors between your source of exogenous variation and your outcome, right? So, and this is certainly the case if you're talking about an actual randomized experiment, right? Why does a randomized experiment work? Because the only thing that actually drives your treatment uh, is the randomization that you have done to it. You've randomly assigned people to get the treatment or not. And since you've randomly done it, it is unrelated to your outcome in any other way. There's no back door from the coin flip that you made to assign somebody to get treated or not and whatever the outcome happens to be. That is why randomized experiments work. Uh, if anything else can mimic that same structure, then you don't need to actually randomize. You can just use that same structure as you observe it in the world. Sometimes this comes in the form of randomization that other people have done. So let's take a classic example. So there's a famous economics paper that wants to look at the effect of being in the military. Does being in the military improve your labor market prospects later on? Does it make you earn more money later? And you can imagine it going 
both ways, right? Maybe being in the military teaches you some great skills and makes you a more effective worker, and so you earn more money later on. But also, being in the military takes you away from time that you could be using to develop your civilian career, and so maybe it hurts your civilian prospects after you get out of the military later on. Well, we can't randomize people to be in the military or not. No one would allow us to do that. Uh, but you can look at something like the draft lottery. Uh, so in the, uh, during the Vietnam War in the United States, uh, there was a draft. So you, you could be compulsorily forced into military service. And the way they did this is they randomized the order of the birth dates. Uh, and so if you happen to be born on, let's say, June 2nd or something like that, maybe that is early in the draft order, or maybe it's late in the draft order, which was determined randomly. Uh, and whether you happen to get drafted or not is going to be based on where you ended up in that order. That's a form of randomization that was not done for like research purposes, but it's a form of randomization that pushes people into treatment and should be pretty much unrelated to other things in the back. There shouldn't be a whole lot of back doors between your birth date and your earnings later on. Maybe some minor stuff, but we can probably control for that, right? It doesn't need to be the case that it's purely completely random. We just need to be able to close all the other back doors. So in that case, we can then isolate the part of treatment that is driven by our randomization. We don't look at the entire universe of people who either went into the military or didn't, because for a lot of those people, they weren't really in our experiment, right? Just like you wouldn't randomize people to wear shorts or not, and then use the entire universe of everybody, you'd limit yourself just to your experimental data. With this, uh, with the birth, the birth date and, and military thing, you would try to find the people who were driven into service by the fact that they were randomly assigned to it because of their birth date. So you can't do this by just picking people like that because you don't know who those people are, but you can do it statistically, right? You can try to use statistics to figure out who was driven into service by this random assignment. And once you can do that, you have effectively found a little group for which you have a random experiment going on, even if you didn't control it. And this is a form of being able to isolate the front door. You can use that random variation uh, to effectively erase all the back doors and just focus on the front doors that you're interested in by picking out just the part of treatment that is driven by that randomization and looking at the relationship between that random part of treatment and the outcomes. So you're looking in at a, little, a small part of your data and in doing so, you're able to identify the effect without having to measure and close all the back doors. Now, there are a lot of specific ways to actually go about doing this and different contexts where it pops up. Uh, and that's what a lot of the, the rest of the videos in this series are going to be about. Uh, uh, for now, let's keep that general concept in mind that we're looking for some sort of source of exogenous random-esque variation uh, that maybe is not explicitly random, but at least has some form of no, either no back doors to it or back doors that we can easily shut down. And we will be thinking about the implications of trying to do that uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank <music> you.